Thanks very much. It's a privilege to be with all of you. And um, I'm going to be talking about a global tragedy that is too many people living on the outskirts of hope. In the United States, we have more than 50 million people living below the poverty line with all of the problems that poverty presents and how we together and the organizations and institutions with which we work and which we represent might contribute to scalable solutions to those social problems. Um, Nonprofits, which have been charged with the responsibility of dealing with disadvantaged populations, populations that are in trouble one way or another, are under enormous stress. Uh, historically, they've been dependent upon government support in the form of grants and contracts, yet government is fiscally challenged. In the case of Illinois, from which I come, government is broke. Um, and similarly, philanthropy, which has been a principal source of funding for the nonprofit sector, uh, is uh, encountering its own financial difficulties. Nonprofits that are seeking to maintain their ask, let alone increase it, are embarking upon an exercise in futility. So increasingly, nonprofits are developing their own earned revenue strategies, that is, creating their own businesses, which uh, allow them to diversify their sources of revenue but also help them drive their respective missions. And at the same time, for-profit social purpose businesses are pursuing market-based solutions to social problems. In both cases, in the nonprofit world and in the traditional business world, engagement with other stakeholders is indispensable. And for that reason, we are seeing an emergence of multi-stakeholder social ventures where interests are aligned, uh, financial and social benefits are returned to investors based upon their own appetites and needs. And the idea is to give each the benefit of its bargain. And I want to talk about a few examples to illustrate the point. Um, coming from Chicago as I do, I am taking the liberty of using Chicago-based examples. Uh, these happen to be examples in which I've had a hand, although my firm is doing this work nationally and increasingly internationally. I just want to show off the flag. So the guy whose picture is here is one Richard M. Daly, uh, the former mayor of the city of Chicago, uh, the longest serving big city mayor in the history of the United States, having served for 22 years in that post. Um, he describes himself even today as the sustainability mayor. Uh, the picture next to him is the green roof on City Hall in Chicago, for which he was responsible. He's also responsible for plantings up and down LaSalle Street, where my office is, and all the other major corridors in the city. He's responsible for bike trails. Um, he made sustainability a policy priority in Chicago. Yet, he was always frustrated by the vagaries of the municipal procurement code, the process by which cities, Chicago among them, um, introduce significant infrastructure improvements. Uh, it's a time-consuming process. It involves a deep evidentiary dive to make the business case that this or that infrastructure improvement is in the best interest of the community. And Chicago is not the only city that faces this frustration. Really, all of the major cities do. Each of the states do as well. And the federal government, through its various agencies, encounters the same uh, difficulty in getting major projects through. So Mayor Daley created a for-profit business called the Sustainability Exchange. And what Mayor Daley did was he uh, partnered with Harvard University, University of Arizona, other educational institutions, and with them made the following offer to big city mayors around the country. Mayor, I know you want to have some infrastructure improvement here. I know you can't make the uh, case because you don't have the budget to retain the scientists, develop the business plan, and prove it out to the satisfaction 
of the policymakers in order for them to bless the project and move forward with it. We will do that for you. And we will do that for you at no cost. So that in the event the deal goes forward after we and our scientific partners have made the case, we will then manage the vendor process. We will do the request for information, uh, the request for proposals. We will see this become law. And we will then ensure that the appropriate vendors are awarded the contracts in the appropriate fashion. If the project dies a morning, somewhere along the line, Mayor Daley goes home with nothing. If, however, the project comes into reality, the sustainability exchange will in fact share in the savings realized by government. So the government incurs no front end cost, bears no risk. If it improves its situation in its community, it now will have compensated the sustainability exchange for getting it there. Mayor Daley was very precise with me about what kind of a business form he wanted to use to launch the sustainability exchange. And it's the low profit limited liability company, the L3C. Parenthetically, I might point out that I wrote that law. And the L3C is the only um, for-profit business form in the United States which by law, irrevocably and permanently, places mission above all other objectives. So the consequence is Mayor Daley was able to galvanize like-minded stakeholders of all stripes, both from the investor point of view and the operating partner point of view, to in a way that ensured that mission will always be respected. He also was able to guarantee, by virtue of the form itself, that there would be an understanding among all counterparties that this venture is branded, signaled, and positioned to do public good and nothing else. Now the L3C is also known as a significant capital formation platform because by law again it tracks the federal tax requirements for program related investments. Those investments made by private foundations in lieu of grants or in addition to grants uh, to satisfy its 5% a year distribution requirements. So this vehicle now attracted foundation funding. That foundation funding was below market rates. It was patient capital with the interests of the investor aligned with that of the venture. And by virtue of the foundation's foregoing market rate returns, the sustainability exchange was thereby able to free up cash flow to create market rate returns for financial first investors who also help support a project. That's the sustainability exchange L3C. I'll identify one other uh, project that's already in the works that does something in a similar way and derives even additional benefits from it. Uh, all of you will know that the mortgage lenders in this country uh, were charged by the attorneys general of having been predators uh, in terms of their residential mortgage practices. And as a consequence, there was a very significant financial settlement where the attorneys general ended up with a big pool of money. The very first tranche of that resulted in Illinois having received $70 million to be doled out at the discretion of Attorney General Lisa Madigan. She decided that she wanted to use that money primarily for education, for counseling, for homeowners, so that those whose homes were below water might nevertheless find a way to keep their homes. And those who didn't understand how to budget might be educated so as to ensure a greater likelihood that they would retain their homes over the long term. Well, two of my clients, Housing Action Illinois, which is the membership organization of 501c3 housing counseling agencies in the state of Illinois, and Neighborhood Housing Services of Chicago, one of those member organizations, but a very large one, decided to partner up. And they created Counseling Data L3C. Um, they wanted to have a vehicle that they would equally own. They originally came in and said, hey Mark, why don't we just set up a joint venture? I discourage that on grounds of liability. Where there is a partnership or where there is a joint venture, both participants or all participants might share in the debts of the other and we don't want to do that. We wanted to have as an entrepreneurial venture a new entity created 
to isolate the liabilities that are associated with that venture. So we could have created an LLC, a traditional limited liability company, but I recommended an L3C and that's what we ultimately did. And the reason is this, whereas a limited liability company has a commercial objective, it is driven by profits. An L3C, by law, is primarily for charitable or educational purposes. So had the two nonprofits created an LLC, uh, they might have been misunderstood or criticized for pursuing a commercial aim. Whereas now with an L3C, there's absolutely no daylight between the exempt purposes of the parent charities and the for-profit social enterprise that they both own. We then secured foundation funding, and I've described to you how that works, from the Pierce Family Foundation in Chicago to fund the cost of software, a robust interactive software solution that housing agencies might make available to consumers. Um, Pierce funded $350,000 for that purpose. And the strength of that, we knocked on Attorney General Madigan's door and asked for a piece of that funding from the predatory lenders. She wrote a check for $500,000. So on day one, this startup venture for social purposes had 850,000 bucks in the till. Not a bad way to start a business. Once the venture now will make this software available throughout the state, we are now looking at, okay, what do we do for an encore? And we're looking at ways of really taking that intellectual property, rolling it out nationally through a franchise-like distribution strategy. And increasingly, we're seeing social enterprise franchises take center stage as well. So it's kind of an interesting example, both in terms of governance, capital formation, branding, positioning, and signaling, and then scaling up and rolling out, whether it be through replication, strategic alliance, or franchising. So what's next? Probably you don't know what that's a picture of. Uh, it intends to be a, an artist's conception of the new presidential library that's coming to Chicago, one Barack Obama presidential library in the south side of Chicago. Uh, this will be an economic engine, but a social impact engine as well. Um, one of the ways in which we're going to be capitalizing on that social impact opportunity is the creation of community-based, worker-owned cooperatives, which will leverage place-based anchor institutions like the University of Chicago, the Museum of Science and Industry, Illinois Institute of Technology, and other permanent, established, rich organizations that in furtherance of their respective corporate social responsibility agendas will now purchase products or services from community-based, worker-empowered ventures created for the very purpose of serving initially that audience, but with that structural revenue now can go out to the wider community, having the financial strength and confidence so that those worker-owned uh, worker owners now can support their families, upgrade their skills, and improve their financial situations to the benefit of all of us. So this is all about building a sustainable impact ecosystem, one in which each of us has a role, and I invite you to exercise your responsibility and to the extent you can participate in driving positive social change through these business strategies, I invite you to join us. Thank you so much.